What happens in the brain during migraine, with aura or without aura? Peter, tell us. The first thing, the first thing to say is that in asking the question, it, it, it says something really fundamental about how we currently think about migraine, because we started to say straight away what happens in the brain in migraine. It's, it's like saying migraine's a problem in the brain, and, and we should say that that's what we currently think. And I, and I say it to and I say it to people all the time. I mean, the, it, neurology does brain, migraines in the brain. Neurology should do migraine. I mean, it's like it is what it is. And we, we've learned a lot about what's happening in the in the brain in migraine. We know quite a lot about the earliest phase, and I divide it that way first: the premonitory or the prodromal phase, is hours or days before the attack, when a patient, when the, the sufferer can feel perhaps cognitive dysfunction, um, they can get a little bit moody, they might um, yawn or they get sleepy, um, they could get cravings for sweet things or savoury things, they could pass more urine, neck discomfort. And we know that there's changes in the hypothalamic region, there are brainstem changes in the midbrain, around, probably in the periaqueductal grey, changes in, uh, in the ponds. We know from um, Anna May's work um, that there's a variation in the response of the trigeminal nucleus to a nociceptive um, stimulus. So we know hours to days beforehand that the brain is changing. Indeed, it's part of the attack. And uh, it really says that it, it, it's really been illuminated by brain functional imaging and reinforced the fact uh, that migraines are a neurologic disease that we can understand. We can understand, and it's exciting to think that in the brain there's, um, for example, changes in the hypothalamic region and if I and if we say regulation um, fluid regulation for example passing more urine or we talk about things like um, the cravings appetite stimulation we start to understand where that might that biology might be we understand that there are um, changes in visual cortex with photophobia which you know, it's not going to surprise a neurologist that the vi that the cortex changes but reinforces how biological this problem uh, is and then finally um, we're starting to uh, we're starting to even to look into the the end of the attack the post dromal phase and starting to see widespread brain and cortical dysfunction um, during the post drone when patients will say for hours or a day they just feel drained and like their brains turned off well guess what the brain is turned off but it's it's marvelous that we get, get these insights into what have been complex they they sound vague a little bit but that's because they're complex and, the, and, and we, we're illuminating that, I think, now with brain uh, imaging. And I think what happens in the brain is it amplifies sensory information that's coming into the brain. It's like migraine is a sensory amplification, pr a problem with sensory amplification, so that the light in here all of a sudden suddenly becomes too bright for me, sound becomes too loud, odors become too pungent and noxious, and perhaps you know, nociceptive information that's continuously sort of traveling into the brain that's not registering as pain, maybe that's amplified as well. Mm. Spatial equilibrium. Some people get dizzy or vertiginous during their attacks. And so when you think about it, it's really, it really, migraine is a disorder where the brain is amplifying the sensory information that's coming into it. And one of the things that to me is really interesting is that we have this series of functional imaging uh, studies that show us each aspect of brain change before the attack, during the attack, after the attack, at the same time that we have the evolution of preventive agents that probably don't cross into the brain at all. And there must be some interaction between the brain and the periphery that these new drugs are stopping. Now I know trigeminal ganglion counts because they do get to the trigeminal ganglion, but I'm thinking they're not getting into the brain. And if they're not getting into the brain, then you're able to stop this process peripherally while the brain itself is changing, presumably, underneath it. Uh, what are you, You're looking skeptical at, at, I, at me. Let's stop a second. Why in the patient, in the process, of a severe migraine attack, does doing a occipital nerve block turn the process off? Think about it. The occipital nerve is not in the distribution of the pain. It's not part of the trigeminal nerve. But I think what David said is correct. There are centers in the brain that amplify noise. And if you quiet that center down, the noise coming 
from elsewhere. And I, Peter, you demonstrated if you stimulate the nerves, you're recording from the brain stem, and you stimulate from the superior sagittal sinus, you cut information off. So I, I think the problem is like we're creating a wall between the inside and the outside of the brain when it's one system that interacts constantly. constantly. And I think we can affect the system at multiple points. If we decrease input to the brain, if we modify the way the brain responds, and I think we can't say it's A or B, it's both.